Thank you very much indeed, Susan. That's a very warm welcome and nice to see so many faces on, um, on what's quite a, a cold, bleak night outside. So it's a very different talk, this on Zoom. So I hope everyone can hear me okay. And um, as Susan mentioned, my housekeeping rule is that Geordie is compulsory. And um, unfortunately, I don't come with subtitles. But anyway, let's move on. My name's uh, Steele and I'm going to tell you all about the Isle of May. It's going to be a 45 minute whistle stop tour of the cultural, historical, religious history of the Isle of May and also all about its wildlife and what it's like to live and manage the island itself. So we shall begin and hopefully we'll, uh, we'll get this started. Um, let's see if I'll get this technology right. Um, so here we go. For those who don't know where the Isle of May is, it's in the Firth of Forth on the east coast of the United Kingdom in between the Lothian coast on the south and to the Fife to the north coast there. And you can just see it sticking out there. We're about six miles out into the North Sea. As you can see there, there is the Isle of May. That's it from, from an aerial point of view. It's about a mile long and half a mile wide. It's about 57 hectares in total. And you can see here, this is the view from the west side of the island, the West Cliffs, um, which rise up to sort of up to 200 feet in height and slope down to the east side. Very remnant of most of the islands on the east coast of the United Kingdom. What's a great view of it there on a nice... And nice sunny day that island is a, but the island is for a lot of but mainly it's seabirds which was designated back in 1956 as a national nature for its impressive array of seabirds which nest on there the assemblage of birds is incredible but we'll talk about that very soon just some, uh, some designations. Well, we're designated to the hilt, really. National Nature Reserve since 56, one of the first in Scotland. We're an SPA, an SAC, a triple SI. And the most recent, just announced just in December, we're also a marine protected area um, for the outer fourth. So some wonderful protection of the island, which helps the birds and the wildlife in general thrive to this day. So starting off the Isle of May tour, here we go, 45 minutes, um, as much as I can cram in as possible. So we're going to start with this. It's all about the, the history of the island. It's got some, some fascinating history, could almost do a whole talk on the history of the island, um, dating right back to early Christianity, right back to the 7th century, when people first set foot on the island. This view you can see here, this is of the monastery, which was built in the 12th century and uh, survived up until the dissolution of the monasteries in the, in the 15th. So you can see the building here, and it always did have um, links with early Christianity and through some early, and one particular called Ethanon, who actually uh, went on to put um, a miracle or three miracles which is how he was stained and he became uh, Saint Ethanon and he died amongst the Picts in 669. He brought early Christianity to the East Coast and to the Isle of May and as a result a lot of pilgrims came to the island thereafter hoping to be, uh, hoping to be healed by powers of Ethanon but unfortunately as you're about to find out it didn't always uh, work out. So you can see the building and that's what it looked like. That's what uh, they believe the, um, the buildings look like with the cloisters in the center. I'll just use my cursor here. There's the cloisters there. Um, interestingly, there's the front door um, to the building. And if you look back on the uh, original picture, uh, the front door is just right there in just that corner there. Um, the actual hinge to that door still exists. It's still there in, in situ. And that long corridor came and that was the cloisters there. Um, some of the most interesting parts when I spoke to the archaeologists who dug this site between 1990 and 1996 was this area, um, because this area, as you probably can see in the image there in the bottom left, uh, was the communal toilet. <laughs> Almost uh, up to 10 people could go to that toilet and they can find some fascinating things about waste. So they found some uh, interesting discoveries and what they were eating, etc. Just to, uh, to, to move on, obviously, um, during an archaeological dig, they found many things. And, um, and for those sharp-eyed, you probably noticed already in the foundations of the 12th century chapel, you can actually see the skeleton remains here. There was several skeleton remains. In fact, over 40 um, were discovered. And most of these were of old men. Um, presumably, these were monks. Um, men living to an, a certain age and, of course, in one spot, were probably decreed as, as monks. 
There was another part of the island adjacent to the buildings, um, which found a, which were discovered to have a lot more bodies. And uh, in that area, there was a mix of sexes, males, females, and of all ages. And they were believed that those were the people who came on pilgrimage to be saved and unfortunately died on the island. And during the dig, we used obviously looked at some of those bones and uh, very carefully and with modern science, we've discovered a lot of things. And, um, and you can see the bones in the, in, the, in the cysts here, just on the left, the, the burials here. Um, but um, these bones on the right, um, these were actually of a man who died of severe prostate cancer. Um, he died around the seventh century, and it was believed this is the first known uh, case of prostate cancer in the UK. And the reason to know that is these black uh, black legions, and also the uh, the honeycomb effect on the bones. There, it was a man aged between forty five and fifty nine, and he travelled down from the Highlands, obviously to be cured of his illness, but uh, but perished on the island. So even to this day, they're still learning about the fascinating history of the uh, of the island. However, it was this discovery of this man, this young man on the island, which was probably the most noteworthy of all the discoveries that they made. As you can probably see from that uh, skeleton remains, you can, well, you can actually see if you're sharp eyed in his mouth, there is a scallop shell. Who this man is, no one knows. There was, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion about who he is. He was certainly important. He was buried up at the high altar of the main chapel and, uh, and obviously with a scallop shell in his mouth. Reference to scallop shells, for some of you, some of you I'm sure will know, normally I would ask you, but I can't hear you, so, um, so I'll tell you. Um, obviously in the, uh, in the medieval period, it was, uh, it was a dangerous place to go on pilgrimage to the Middle East because of the holy wars. So a lot of people went on a pilgrimage to northern Spain, to a, to a town or city called Santiago de Compostela, and uh, where the bones of St. James currently lie. And if you did that pilgrimage and returned, you were buried with a scallop shell. It was a sign that you had actually made the journey, you'd actually gone on that uh, pilgrimage. And this gentleman, this young man, had obviously uh, done that pilgrimage, returned and died on the island. However, it's the only skeleton remain to this day, but it's found with this uh, scallop shell in his mouth, wedged in his mouth. So who this man was, well, we can only guess, but of obviously some significance to where he was buried on the island and with this uh, scallop shell. So moving forward a bit, coming out of the, uh, the medieval period, moving towards the, uh, the 17th century, this is Scotland's first ever lighthouse. Uh, it was constructed in 1636, and this is the base of it. It was actually three floored. It was built by Alexander Cunningham, and that gives you some kind of idea of what it was like. It was three floored, and right up on the top, there was a, a, a basket burning of coal. So they used to hoist the coal up on that uh, rig on the right-hand side of the building, having humped it all the way from the other side of the island um, to the very pinnacle of the island, and then up onto the basket um, where it was burnt. About a ton of coal was burnt every night, about 400 tons in total uh, were, were burnt. And um, interestingly, they used to charge the ships, the passenger ships used to be charged a levy and um, for, for, for the use of this coal or the sale of the coal. And uh, interestingly, they charged the English boats twice as much money as the Scottish boats. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, this, this continued to be burning for sort of nightly for sort of 300 years. But then in 1791, disaster struck. Um, in 1791, looking for Anne Struther on an evening, they realised the basket wasn't lit. And for two more consecutive nights, the storm raged and the basket still wasn't lit. So they sent out a search party to see what was going on. That search party arrived at the beginning and opened the doors and were confronted by disaster. As uh, the lighthouse keeper, George Anderson, and his wife and five children were all lying there. Of them all, four children and the two adults were dead presumably by carbon monoxide poisoning from the, uh, the ash which had been tipped over from the side of the building over the last 150 years. However, the story doesn't stop there because the young baby, uh, Lucy, who was only three months of age, was actually rescued. He was actually still alive. So she was taken back to Anne Struther where she was adopted. And then she went on to actually marry the small boy who was six years old, who was actually in the search party, who went out with his dad, married him and emigrated to America, where they went on to have 12 children. 
And, um, and interestingly, uh, some of the great descendants of, uh, of Lucy actually visited the Isle of May two years ago, which was a fascinating story in its own way, just to show them where it all began. However, you know, this, uh, this building has limitations, you know, burning coal on top of a, on top of a building, you know, in, in a big easterly storm as we've just had, it would have been seen or wouldn't have been seen very far out at sea. And in 1810, two Royal Navy frigates went ashore at Dunbar. So at that stage, they decided that was enough. We need to change our stance. We need to start to build a lighthouse. So they got their chief engineer, the Northern Lighthouse Board. And here in 1816, on the 1st of September, Robert Stevenson's lighthouse, this grand lighthouse, as you can see, was, uh, was flashing across the Isle of May. And it still does to this day. It can be seen for 22 nautical miles. Lots of human history with this building, as you could imagine. It was actually the first electric lighthouse in Scotland, but then was converted back to oil due to the cost. Um, and to this current day in 2015, you can probably just see in the bottom right-hand side of the photograph, it was converted to solar panel. The generators were removed and the solar power now powers that lighthouse day and night um, throughout the entire uh, winter and summer that we have. And um, they do have, uh, the Northern Lighthouse Board do have more faith in the winter, uh, winter sun than my good self, but it still flashes to this day, which is fantastic news. For anyone visiting the Isle of May, um, this lighthouse is open. We do actually have access to it at weekends and you can go to the very top. It's free of charge to enter and you can go to the, the very pinnacle. It's a fabulous building. Third and final building on the north, third and final lighthouse on the, on the Isle of May is this. It's the Low Lighthouse. It was built in 1844, but was only in commission for 40 years. This building then went on to have more significance in the history of the Isle of May because in 1934, the, uh, the Isle of May Bird Observatory was founded, and in 1946, they moved into this building where they are now. So volunteer bird watchers can go out and stay in that very cottage from, Monday, uh, from Saturday to Saturday on a, on a weekly basis between the 1st of April and the end of October. It's a beautiful building to live in and it just had a revamp a few years ago, so it's very nice indeed. Just to give you the scale, there's the lighthouses. You can see the low light in the bottom corner, the beacon sort of up on the hill and then right up on the top, this grand uh, Stevenson lighthouse. And um, the lighthouse keepers eventually departed the island on, in March 1989. That's when the lighthouse went automatic and that's when it was turned over to the birds and the staff and researchers like myself. So the Isle of May, well, it's got a lot of history. I could do an entire talk on the history of the Isle of May, but we're going to move straight to its main subject, why it's so important and this is it. It's for its seabirds, its wildlife. UK is, over, is home to over 5 million seabirds and uh, a third of all seabirds in the EU breed in the UK. We're pretty significant. We've got lots of islands and just like the Isle of May, we host lots and lots of birds. So I'm just going to go through a few, just give you some examples of what's, uh, what we've got out there and some of, the, uh, some of the quirky little stories about one or two. And uh, this, uh, um, oh well, normally I would ask what these birds are, but um, since I can't hear you, I'm going to tell you that these are the shags. Um, top left there, you've got breeding pairs of shags there with that fine crest, beautiful plumage, that green emerald eye, just stunning when you see them this close. They're about two thirds the size of a cormorant. So you can, uh, you can tell often um, a cormorant are much bigger. And, uh, and if you see anything inland, generally it's a cormorant. Shags are very much marine, very much coastal birds. And they can uh, build some great structures. They can build these structures on nest sites on the right hand side there, normally on eggs by the end of March. I'm not entirely sure that'll happen this year um, because of what we're currently going through, but generally in a normal year, but on eggs by the end of March. And then by the end of April, their chicks will hatch and that's their chicks in the bottom left corner. And every time I see this photograph, I look at them and think, goodness gracious, you are quite ugly, aren't you? Anyway, <laughs> I hope they don't take offense to the shags, but they do have a quite unique uh, upbringing because they, uh, they are com bo um, born completely, uh, completely bald and naked, as you can see there, and actually blind. And uh, it takes three or four days before sort of the down starts to grow and it takes six weeks to fledging stage, which you can see in the bottom right corner there. That's sort of come mid-July around the Isle of May. That's what we like to see, lots of shags. However, 
it's not been easy for Shags, and I've uh, and I've got to say that with validation because uh, you can see here this is a graph since 1990. You can see the big plummet in 92, 93, um, down to difficult feeding years. It's never really recovered the population. Um, we have just over uh, 400 pairs. We've got 495 pairs at present. And I must admit, I'm a bit worried about the population having uh, just gone through a whole week and a half of easterly winds where birds will struggle. It's approximately 17,500 pairs nationwide, but nationwide they're also declining. So this is a bird of concern. What else have we got? Well, we've got these birds. They may not need any introductions. They do look like seagulls. I suppose technically they are, but these are kittiwakes. And if you approach a kittiwake colony, well, you'll, uh, you'll hear these birds, they're fabulous birds. Um, you'll hear their distinctive call, which is how they were named, as they go, kittiwake, kittiwake, kittiwake. It's a fantastic call. And you can see here, they're, uh, they're currently off Greenland at this moment in time, nowhere near the North Sea. They're currently off Greenland, will return back in March, start nesting in April, May, and then by June, they'll have chicks, as you can see in the bottom left. See, see, Jags, they've got a better idea. Look how cute those are. Um, so they'll lay two to three eggs um, and have two to three chicks and then go on to fledge. And uh, in the bottom right there, you can see a fledgling. That's a, a youngster who's now on the wing um, and he looks very different to the adult. He's got a lot of black markings on, on, his, on his, his back there, that sort of distinctive V on his back and these black markings on his bill and on his nape. And that's just simply because it lets other adults identify that it's a chick. So if that bird eventually or inevitably crash lands into a nest site, he can uh, be identified as a youngster and they'll take it easy on him. Obviously, it's not an adult trying to steal a nest site or a mate, so they'll just uh, they'll give it a peck and send it on its way, but not as bad if it's an adult. Kitty wakes. Well, it's more bad news for kitty wakes as just like shags because kitty wakes have the distinction of being the fastest declining seabird in the United Kingdom. We'd lost somewhere in the region of 65% all kitty wakes since 1986. Just to give you an example, this is the Isle of May population. You can see we're up in the 8,000s pairs mark in the 1990s, and we're way down sort of just over the 3,000 mark um, at its current rate. We are seeing a slight spike in the right direction, which is encouraging, but we need many more years to sort of recover back to where we are. Where we are. Just to give you some example of, of what it's like nationally as well, this is a picture which is, is, is very similar on a national scale. Um, up on Fair Isle, it's an island off Shetland. Some of you may know it for its knitwear and on fact of being for its birds. Um, back in 1990, at the same time this graph was made, there was over 20,000 pairs of kitty wakes on, on Fair Isle. And last year, there was less than 200 pairs. That shows you the scale of the decline. What else? I need some good news, don't I? <laughs> That's what I need to do. I need to bring in some good news. Well, let's start with these. Um, these are the penguins of the Isle of May. Look at these birds. These are guillemots. And um, we often call them penguins of, of, of the Northern Hemisphere because obviously we've got no penguins in the Northern Hemisphere. But you can see with this bird here, it just got a single egg. It's incubating under its feet there. Don't actually build a nest. They just lay one egg. These birds will be nesting by April, May, tuck that single egg under its feet and they'll share incubation duties. And uh, you can see there, once it's, um, once and in the picture in the bottom right corner, so you have the colony there, obviously there'll be several of those birds actually on nests, but we cannot actually see them because they just took their eggs under their feet. Interestingly, um, guillemots, about 4% of the Isle of May's population is known as bridal guillemots. It's the same species, but you can see in the top right corner there, um, the bird at the front there with that lovely white spectacle, uh, which you can see. And there's been some uh, discussion re in recent times about why they have that. We do know that in the populations of the May, it's 4%. And then further north you go, it increases. So it's about 20% up in the high Arctic. But fascinating birds, and they do, uh, they do interbreed. So why they have that mark is, is just a conjecture at the moment. Anyway, after 28 days of incubating that uh, single egg under their feet, um, the, uh, the chicks will hatch. And here's the chicks. Fabulous birds. In fact, that uh, adult there, you can see it's got its chick under its wing, just, uh, just cowering there, just uh, getting some warmth by, its, by one of its parents. And uh, at this stage, which is only about 20 days of age, you can see with guillemots, uh, they're, not, they're not feathered at this stage. They're not even ready to fly yet. Um, they can't, certainly not independent, um, but they're extremely young and still vulnerable. So as a result, 
the females, the mothers, will depart the island. That's their job done, gone, after 20 days. And the males will go down to the sea. So at dusk, they'll go down to sea and they'll not be feeding the chick. So the chicks are way up, up, up a height, sort of 50 meters, 200 foot up. And the chicks are looking down at their dad and the dad's calling them down. And of course, they don't have flight feathers. They don't have, certainly have wings to fly, but they've got only one option. Otherwise, they're not going to get fed or have the protection of the dad. They've got one option and it's to jump. <laughs> you can see this one. This was one taken by Professor Mike Harris, captured it so well, who does research for UKCH on the island. He captured it superbly well. Um, that's a big, big drop. I might not look it, um, but that chick is jumping for its life and, um, and, and going down. You can imagine on the way down, they don't all make it. Some of them get stuck in kitty wake nests and you can see the kitty wakes going, go on, get out. But eventually they'll all bounce and they'll all get down to the bottom and hit the sea. Because they're so young, 20, 21 days of age, their bones haven't fully developed, so it allows them to take some impacts. So they can't take, hit those big impacts. It looks brutal, but they can take it. And then they will follow dad and head out into uh, the North Sea. They'll go about 60 miles out to the wee banky or to Dogger Bank, where they'll have the safety. But of course, they have to be raised by dad for the next two months before independence. Interesting strategy of life, but it works. Because guillemots, if you can follow this graph, the, these graphs, the general trend of guillemots in the United Kingdom is increasing and uh, it's gone up by 32% over the last 30 years. And on the Isle of May, we've been seeing increases as well. So it's great news for the guillemots and it's great news for this talk, but I can actually have some positives. Anyway, <laughs> moving on, another species, a close relative of the guillemot. This is the razor bill. Very similar, except as you can see from its bill there, it's thick bill with its white markings, beautiful birds. And very similar strategy to the guillemot will lay a single egg, tuck it under its feet, they'll incubate it for 30 days, the chick will hatch, and after 20 days, the adult male will go down into the sea, call the chick down, and away to the wee banky it goes. What an upbringing, goodness gracious. For someone who doesn't like heights, I'm not coming back as a guillemot or raise a bill chick. But anyway, fabulous birds. And razor bills are also doing well. Um, we've got just over 6,000 pairs on the Isle of May and nationally have also been increasing as well. So that's good news um, for both the two orc species. Onto this species, which is a real specialist seabird. So this is a fulmer. Um, this is the fulmers, the top left there, gaggling, cackling away there. There's a little group, but close up on the right hand side, you can see. Superb birds, beautiful eyes, and, and, and you can see there. <clears throat> and incredible birds. They're such long living birds, these. Um, it's sort of, we just sort of describe them as the albatrosses of the north. Again, we haven't got albatrosses, but like albatrosses, these can live for a very long time. Um, fulmers don't start breeding until they're eight years old. Now, if you think most of your garden birds, your blue tits and your blackbirds, they'll be breeding after their first year of life. Um, in fact, most of them will probably be dead after eight years, but the fulmer only starts breeding after eight years of age. And some of the longevity records for fulmer suggest that these birds are living beyond 60 years of age. And we're still trying to, well, we're still finding out about these birds. So who knows how long these will go on to live for. And they'll lay a single egg and just like albatrosses, they just take forever. They can take somewhere between 56 and 62 days to incubate an egg which is a long time to be sitting on a single egg over two months. And uh, they're on eggs by mid-May. And then by early July, the chick hatches. And then they take another two and a bit months to fledge their chicks. And you can see just one chick, one egg will lay. That's down in the bottom left corner. And they've got a great defensive mechanism. And you can see in the bottom right, they squirt out this oily, fishy substance from the pit of their stomach. And nothing messes with a fulmer, except researchers and myself. And uh, we pay the ultimate price because, as you can see, we get this oil on us and it stays with us and it stinks. <laughs> we then inevitably burn our clothes after three or four days because it's just impregnated with oil um, from fulmers. But certainly any other birds, even predators, will just stay clear. They know not to touch a fulmer. Fulmers have, uh, have been uh, colonised in the Isle of May since the 1930s on the East Coast. That's when they started coming in. And, uh, and ever since, we've been fairly stable at about 300, uh, about 300 pairs um, of fulmers on the Isle of May. 
So another species we, uh, we look at um, and have got, well, one of the biggest colonies, we've got over one and a half percent of the entire British Isles population of these birds. Um, and these are eider ducks. If you're on the coast at all, you may see one or two of these. Um, in fact, you might hear their, uh, their displaying. Um, up in the top left there, we've got male, female, and you can see the black and white plumage of the male. He's just got one purpose in life, and that's to display and mate, and he leaves the female to do all the hard work. She's camouflage, as you can see from her colours. She comes ashore in over 1,200 pairs, nest on the May, and they'll um, sit for four weeks incubating their eggs. In that time, in that four weeks, they'll not budge. They'll generally sit on their eggs and for four weeks, so she has to be in good body condition before undertaking that, uh, that epic fast. But after four weeks of hatching, um, of, sorry, of incubating, the chicks eventually hatch, and within 24 hours, they'll take them straight out to sea. They'll take them away from the island and to the, the, the harbors and the uh, nearby coastline for, for some relative protection away from the gulls. Interestingly, in that time, they just all gang together in these big super crushes. You can see the march of the eiders here. Um, eider ducks and eider ducklings, are, uh, we don't really know which one's which, whose mother's who. Um, it's aunties, it's failed breeders, it's the mother themselves, and they just all pile together. Fabulous birds, and uh, they're doing okay. Moving on, uh, we have tern species. Um, I wish I was where some of these terns are because some of these terns are in the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, all four of these terns are in the Southern Hemisphere. So on the top left, we've got sandwich terns. We've encouraged them back in recent years. We've got a small population. They're currently off the west of Africa. Um, they'll be back in our waters in April and nesting on the island from May till July. The top right one is a, is a story we're trying to, uh, to encourage and to try and bring back the population of rosier terns. You can tell it's a rosier, it's got a slightly pink hue to it, but more to the point, it's got an all black beak, it's got a black bill. And if you look at the other bills of the other terns, it gives it away a bit. These are endangered. Um, there's only 130 pairs nesting in the United Kingdom. They all nest in, in Northumberland. But a couple of years ago, we did manage to get one on the Isle of May breeding with a common tern. And we're hoping to uh, encourage more in the future. Speaking of common terns, and the bottom left, currently off West Africa as well, is a common tern. You can see there it's got a red bill with a, a black tip compared to the bird on the right, which is an Arctic tern. If anyone comes to the Isle of May, there's a good chance during the summer you can see all four species and I probably can guarantee seeing the one on the bottom right corner, the Arctic Tern, because if you come on the island, it's going to introduce itself. This is an Arctic Tern and this is the last view you will have of it before it pecks your head. Um, Arctic Terns are currently uh, on, on, on the wintering grounds and, uh, and during the summer they'll breed on the Isle of May beside the footpaths. And you can see uh, down by the jetty, and you can see that they'll defend their nests and their young by pecking people's heads. They always go for the tallest point, which is quite comical because the parents always get attacked while the children are laughing. And, uh, and we, uh, we can see the through pack a, a ferocious punch. Um, interestingly, I always use a stat about Arctic terns because they weigh the same as two chunky Kit Kats. <laughs> and, um, and by sort of uh, mid-June or uh, into July, the chicks will hatch here, some, uh, some chicks which have hatched on the, uh, on the Isle of May. And sort of at this stage of life for these chicks, I often wonder, you know, you've got about 30 days where you're going to be up until you're fledged, until you can start flying. But do they, do they realize that, you know, here we are in July, um, do you realize by sort of September that they'll become known as the world's longest distant bird migrant? These chicks will follow their parents to the other side of the world. Um, and currently at present in early February, um, our Arctic terns from, uh, from, from Northern England and uh, in the east of Scotland and the Isle of May birds will be off the east coast of the Antarctic. Just where that red arrow is, to be precise. <laughs> there are uh, studies have shown that they, um, from by, by Dr. Chris Redfern and co, um, have shown that uh, the Arctic terns are feeding on krill and are currently there. Um, and we did have a good idea that these birds were traveling some distance because a chick ringed on the Farn Islands, my old stamping ground, and back in 1982 was found 100 days later in Melbourne, Australia. They knew then that things were, uh, were foot, that these birds were obviously uh, migrating some distance. And with modern technologies, we now know exactly where they are. And that's where they are. 
sort of by early March, they'll start pinging their way north. They'll start coming up through the South Atlantic and start making their way back. And by late April, early May, we'll be back on the Isle of May, ready to peck heads all over again. You've been warned. So the third for final species I've not touched on and uh, I'm now going to introduce, it's the most numerous of all the species. There's over 40,000 pairs on the Isle of May. We, it is the commonest breeding seabird on the Isle of May. It's also uh, it's the third largest colony of them in the United Kingdom. Only the Shants and St Kilda have more. And of course, this is the Atlantic Puffin. This is the Puffin. There he is in all his glory on the island. And it's usually at this point, I usually point out that puffins are not the size of a lighthouse. Um, you'll be surprised. Um, I've had people, I've had people, I've spoke to folk who believe that's for birds on Lundy Island, um, down in the Bristol Channel, three foot tall. Well, I can tell you about puffins aren't three foot tall. Um, they're about the size of a bag of sugar. So if you think of a bag of sugar with a beak and two wings, you've got yourself a puffin. Puffins are very specialist seabirds. All seabirds are specialists. They've all got their little um, individual uh, traits, and, and so do puffins. Um, they'll come ashore in late March, early April, and they'll come back to the same nest hole, and they'll also pair bond for life. So life for a puffin can be about 35 years. The oldest puffin is 43. So puffins can live a fair age, and they will pair bond for life, and they've got lots of tools that they'll use um, for various, uh, various adaptations like this for example. So puffins can f feed on a lot of sand eels, they can hold, well the record is 61 allegedly, I've not counted myself but I've been told, um, but you can see the serrated edges inside the beak, this is inside the mouth, you can see them pointing inwards and that just allows them to catch one fish, one sand eel and then keep catching more and putting them in, keeping them in place while they're going to catch more and more. They've also got some extremely sharp claws as well, as you can see. Uh, researchers certainly know about these birds because um, these claws are really sharp. And uh, they'll use these to dig burrows. They'll use them to, to spring clean the ones which have, have maybe sort of had some uh, soil to come in during the winter. They've had a bit of washing um, and they'll use them. Um, it's an old wives tale that puffins, uh, puffins, uh, well, rabbits dig them for puffins. Puffins very much dig it for themselves. And just to show you there, that's what a puffin looks like underground. Um, it'll just lay a single egg. It'll be on a single egg by mid-April and it'll incubate for 40 days. And then by the end of April, uh, sorry, the end of May, the chicks will hatch and chicks generally stay underground unless of course we're working with them. And you can see here, this is a puffin chick of about 10 days of age. Um, he knows better. If he pops his head out, he's got a good chance of being predated by the large gulls. So he'll stay underground for 40 days, but eventually he's big enough and old enough to leave the bow. Now puffins will leave without parents' consent and they'll generally leave under the cover of darkness. They'll get away out of, out of their bow and away to sea um, to avoid predation by gulls at night. However, interestingly, on the Isle of May and many islands on, on, on the East Coast, um, puffins, of course, the chicks come out and, you know, why walk through uh, nettle patches or thick vegetation when you can just follow the footpaths on the island? Nice and easy, just follow the paths. So many puffin chicks you can often find as, you, uh, as you're standing outside the accommodation at 12, 1, 2 in the morning. It's just this line of puffin chicks marching past as they head out to the open sea. And this is what one looks like. This is a puffin chick which is uh, 40 days old. It's fledged and he's heading out to the open sea and he'll spend the next three years of his life out there before coming back to land. It's an incredible lifestyle. Adult puffins will, uh, will stay, on, uh, stay on land until early August. Then they depart and they don't touch land till the following March. So they're away bobbing out on the North Sea and the North Atlantic in throughout that eight month period, regardless of the weather, regardless of what's thrown at them. These chicks, by the way, the, North, um, the Scottish Seabird Centre are, uh, are superb at uh, having, a, um, having a, a, pr a press and publicity day in August to highlight that these birds can get disorientated by bright lights. And some of these birds can end up in places like North Berwick and Dunbar and uh, they can be handed into the Seabird Centre and they're sent out to sea on their merry way. It's a great scheme that they uh, continue to do to this day. 
So that's Puffins. Um, just a few things about uh, about seabirds in general. Obviously, uh, there's a mixed picture. Some sort of many seabirds are, are really struggling. And you can see here, this is what the 99% of the seabirds on the island feed on. These are sand eels. And these are uh, these are really sort of nutritious fish. They have a, a, a very oily fish. And, um, and unfortunately, well, humans have harvested these and, uh, and in fact, we've burnt them in power stations in Denmark. We've used them for fish meal and fertilizer, and we've even put them on uh, in, in, in gardens and even fed them to our pets and pet food. Um, and you wonder why we have issues with our seabirds and what uh, the couple of concerns we have of these declines. Well, this certainly doesn't help matters. Other, uh, other realistic um, impacts of, uh, for seabirds is obviously the climate. We, we know the climate is changing. Um, we're seeing sort of in, well, we're certainly getting some wetter summers. And you can see here, that's a puffin bow in the top left there, flooded out. Um, and the egg is destroyed, it's lost. It's been lost to the, to the, to the flooding there. Um, and you can see on the right here, it, it was just a storm which uh, lasted just for one day in mid-June and it actually swept away a lot of the guillemot young and eggs on the lower ledges of those cliffs. So we're definitely seeing climate, which is a climate change, which is affecting our seabirds um, in many ways. We've also got other issues for seabirds. We've got, of course, overfishing, as man has got even better at fishing, um, and uh, we'll be able to harvest even more fish out of the sea. And of course, we're ever, ever um, present threat of pollution. Uh, this was a, a boat, which uh, an 80 ton boat, which went ashore on the Farn Islands um, back in 2013. And it just shows how easy it can happen. But even in 2013, with all the technologies we've got, um, these, uh, these things can, these incidents can happen. And it's always a threat when the island is right beside one of the world's busiest shipping lanes. And of course, the one we all have heard many things about, um, of course, plastic and, uh, and balloons is another good one. And uh, you can see this little hole here. This was a hole of plastic we, we picked up along a hundred meter stretch. Not bad for an island, which is six miles out in the North Sea um, and lots of polystyrene. And of course, birds digest that um, and, and eat it, of course, um, and, and can suffer. So it's a, it's a real and, and, and modern day threat that we've got for seabirds. But anyway, moving on, um, that's some of the threats to seabirds and some of the issues. Um, but moving on about the Isle of May itself, um, this is some of the fantastic things that can happen on the Isle of May. It's an amazing place for wildlife. And back in 2015, the top picture there, we had a pod of killer whales, orcas arrive for an hour at the end of May, uh, checking out the seals on the island before heading back north. With the technologies we've got, with, with these photographs, we're good enough um, to, to be able to photo ID them. Um, and the male, which is the, uh, that, that, that animal there with the big uh, dorsal fin, two meter dorsal fin, um, he's a, a male no, known as Buster. Um, and he normally lives, and this pod normally lives between Iceland and Shetland but uh, decided to have a little, a little excursion down to the Isle of May, which is incredible when you think how close we are to Edinburgh. Only we can see Edinburgh from the Isle of May. That's how close orcas were. And down the bottom there, that's uh, some bottlenose dolphins. And we also get harbour porpoise and minky whales in midsummer. Um, so it's a spectacular place for, for its marine life. Of course, the island, very important in the summer. Um, for its, uh, its seabirds, um, but this is very seasonal because once the seabirds depart by mid-August into early September, um, the island takes over, is taken over by grey seals. We're one of the largest grey seal colonies, in fact we were the largest for a while, we've been overtaken by the Norfolk uh, colonies down in Blakeney, which have got over, over 4,000 animals now down there, or 4,000 pups. But the Isle of May still produces two and a half thousand pups per autumn between September and December. In the bottom right photograph there, you can see the visitor centre and just some of the, uh, all those white dots of all the seal pups and the seals, which I'm sure some of you would have seen on this uh, or last, um, last uh, autumn's autumn watch. BBC Autumn Watch, bringing it live from the colonies, which was spectacular. It's an amazing place and a very important place for seals. And that's why we close it to the public. And in fact, we close all this bottom part of the island. And even me as a reserve manager, I can't even access that bottom because we don't want to disturb the animals during such a vital time when they're given birth. And also it's very dangerous to be amongst great seals at that time of year. So it's a very thriving, it's a thriving population and it's doing well on the island. 
So just to finish off the last sort of five minutes or so of the talk, just a little bit about life on the island. Um, we've, we've experienced all the, uh, all the, uh, all the wildlife it provides um, and how important it is. Well, it's also important for research. It's also important for, for management work, which is what we do. Um, we live in these buildings. This is known as Fluke Street. Um, these were former lighthouse keepers cottages um, built in 1898. Um, these were to help power the lighthouse. Uh, men lived in these, or the families lived in these uh, these cottages. And but now it's it's over to us, and this is where we live. So I'll be moving out there in mid March. So it's not long now, just over sort of five weeks before I move here, and I'm on there till mid November. During that time, in a normal season, we'll have um, we'll have researchers coming in and carrying out their work from UKCEH and the BTO and St Andrews University. We'll also have them coming in from St Andrews and also Nottingham and Manchester University. So it's a real hotbed for, for, for science. And, um, and life on the island, it's not bad. It's not as basic as you think. Top left there, we've got the solar panels which power our, 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 our houses. Um, and the bottom left is the internet, uh, which is beamed all the way from North Berwick from the Scottish Seabird Centre, uh, which is a great, uh, great partnership we've got with them. And, um, and I must thank them for, uh, for, for the internet um, because quite simply it brings us emails and plenty of work. So one of these days I might ask them to uh, actually switch it off. But um, the bottom right there, you can see we've got a well. We pump uh, pump out this well. It goes through reverse osmosis unit, which allows us to have um, water, drinking water and, and showers. And the top right there, we take everything, put the kitchen sink out on an annual basis. That's the hard bit, moving all the stuff. Life out there is not too bad. Um, this is actually my house. This is, uh, it's quite comfortable living, as you can see. I've got a nice, uh, nice multi-burner there in the middle of the room, which has a back boiler, which has radiators on. Um, and it's not too bad of, uh, not too bad. I could be living in Fife, to be honest, in that little flat there. Um, but it's, uh, it's nestled nicely in on the Isle of May. So what else goes on up there? Well, lots of research. There's lots of long-term research. Um, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, UKCH, they've been present um, since the early 70s, got some of the, the longest data set going. Um, you can see the, the bringing of birds here of, of shags. There's Mark in the bottom left corner looking at the, probably the most studied guillemots in the world and, um, and, and, and the like. So but lots of research goes on. Uh, we also partake in it as well. This is my assistant Bex, who is uh, who is is doing uh, the cliff counts, counting the populations of seabirds on an annual basis. Um, notice because I don't like heights, I'm going nowhere near the cliff edge. So I usually volunteer Bex for the job, which you can see here. That's quite a big drop, don't you know? <laughs> Hence why she's there, uh, she's roped in. Anyway, that's a fabulous day of accounting. It happens in June. It's a massive undertaking, as you can imagine, but gives us those trends and we can actually see how birds are doing. Obviously, we've got visit management as well. Um, we've got visitors coming from both sides of the fourth and from the Scottish Seabird Centre. We get a boat daily if weather permits, um, bringing the lovely visitors. But we do police them and we do, uh, we do restrict their numbers to make sure we get a delicate balance right between the nature and the wildlife and the visitor experience. But what an experience. And you get three hours on the island and if you have not been, it's well worth going. But of course, I'm going to say that. <laughs> we also do habitat management to encourage birds back. These are, are simple, basic uh, turn terraces, which uh, encourage the terns to nest and actually brought the sandwich and the, and the rosier turn back to the island as a breeder, uh, which was great news. Very simplistic. Just stick a load of uh, shingle and sand down and bingo, we got the birds back. We also do bird ringing with the Isle of May Bird Observatory, who are our partners and, 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 and their volunteers who are there from, from week to week. And um, plenty of migrant birds ringed on the island. Of course, migrant birds coming in the spring and the autumn as they cross the North Sea. Um, they'll, uh, they'll be looking for land as they make that perilous journey. And because we stick out so far with, of course, a lighthouse at night flashing away, the birds spot us and inevitably land. We can have some spectacular falls of birds on the island and often we do catch them in these specialist traps which are very much like funnels we call them heligoland traps the birds are flushed through the, uh, the vegetation through that funnel if you follow it all the way around there's a catching box on the right hand side the bird observatory caught over six and a half thousand birds in these traps in 2019 and we find birds coming from all parts of the globe um, we literally do 
just a, a, a few, two last slides to finish off with. Um, this is some of the birds, some of the amazing migrant birds we get. It's an amazing place for migration, to see migration happening. We've had over almost 300 bird species recorded on the May. And I will go through these. I've got a little bit of time, I've got a couple of minutes. So on the top left, this bird here, that's a brambling. This is a finch which comes in from Scandinavia uh, for the winter. It comes in the Isle of May and, and winters in Scotland before heading back out in February, March, back to Scandinavia. Uh, a similar sort of migrant trend is this. This is a woodcock, this bird. Um, and in late October, early November, a lot of woodcock arrive on the east coast of the UK, having fleed the, uh, the cold, harsh winters where they're gonna set foot in Russia and uh, Scandinavia. They inevitably winter in, in the UK and head out back, back north and back east um, in March. The bird on the right hand side here, um, size is, uh, is deceptive because this uh, is a gold crest and this is actually Britain's smallest bird. It actually weighs the same as a 20 pence piece. Um, incredible birds and um, once over they didn't believe that these birds could cross the North Sea because they were so little, just weighing six grams. So we actually thought that these birds would hitch ride on short eared owls. Short eared owls would come across from Scandinavia and, when, and these birds were known as owl riders. So <laughs> quite, quite amusing. But I'm glad to say they don't sit on the back of owls. They do migrate across the North Sea. We had a ring bird from Finland just a couple of years ago. And back in, uh, in October 1982, we had 15,000 gold crests on the island of May in one day. It just shows the magnitude of migration when it does happen. Bottom left here, this corner bird here, this is a black cap, this is a female. Sort of majority of those birds either coming from Germany during the winter or coming from Africa in the summer. The bird in the middle is a spotted flycatcher, a sub-Saharan continent, a sub-Saharan um, sub sub migrant, um, currently sunning it up in, in Africa, and it'll be back with us in May, passing through the Isle of May. The bottom one, deceptive on size, as I say, because that's actually a cuckoo. Um, the English population of cuckoos is declining, but the Scottish ones are increasing, um, and these do migrate through the island as they head north to breeding grounds in April, May. And the bottom right is a red wing, which you may, may, may just know. Um, again, another Scandinavian bird coming in for the winter, and we can have some spectacular numbers of these as well. In one day, there was over 30,000 past the Isle of May just, a, sort of, over, just over 10 years ago, which is a, an impressive number. And of course, we do get lots of strange and wonderful birds as well, some migrant birds, some really rare birds. Um, this top left one, this is a quail. Um, a quail hen to Scotland, um, don't often see them. This middle one is a blue throat. It's a member of the robin family, um, doesn't breed in Britain, but it's just passing. Because we've got no trees, it's quite unusual to see woodpeckers. That's a great spotted woodpecker. Um, chiseling himself out of the rock there, chiseling for food. Um, very much <laughs> not part of the Isle of May because we don't have trees and soon moved on. Um, and we can have things like continental um, overshoots, like hoopoos. We've had over 20 in our, in our time, but the last one just a couple of years ago. And then this bottom right bird, which is a, a flamboyant bird from Southeast uh, Europe called the rose colored starling. So it's a starling, but extremely pink. Um, we've had a few of those and then one last year, in fact, in fact, that's last year's bird. So it does attract some amazing birds, amazing wildlife. But of course, um, it's just an amazing place to see. And if you do want to see it, um, we are open. We're going to be open again this year from the 1st of April to the 30th of September. Obviously, COVID is having its say, so boat uh, numbers will be restricted. So please check online um, at the Scottish Seabird Centre. Go online on their, their, their website um, and you can book, uh, book a, a place. Um, and as I say, it's almost daily uh, weather dependent. And you get three hours on the island and it's just a spectacular place to come and see it, um, to breathe it, to live it and to meet us, of course, and hear all about it. So you can book online, you can also see some live cameras from the island. Um, when uh, the, the, the sorted, they'll be up and running on the island, so you can see them on the website. And if you'd like to port, it's a small charity and it, it, it does rely, it nearly went to the, uh, nearly, nearly went to the, 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 the floor uh, last year. It only survived by, by the, the generous donations of people. So if you want to donate again, just go on the website. If you're coming from the north, the Fife side, you can get boats from Fife and Anstruther and, and um, for, for the Mayor Princess and the, the, the Osprey and across the Dunbar for the Blue Wild. 
if you want to follow the islands blog you're very welcome you can uh, you can do that um it's it's put on there and uh, also we've got a facebook page and if you want to follow the tweets of a madman i'm sure plenty of you do um you can follow me direct um as i tweet away while i'm living on the island from march to uh, november but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you an absolute whistle-stop tour of the Isle of May. I think there's only one thing to sort of say and, and to do. Well, to do is to come to the island, come and see it for yourself, and you'll get a real flavouring for it. But also, I would just like to thank you all for listening and, uh, and taking part in this. I know it's, uh, it's a bit difficult, a one-way process, but I hope you have enjoyed in your homes um, across the UK tonight and enjoyed. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that, David. Uh, an absolutely excellent talk, which tells us about the history of the island uh, and the wildlife too. Um, so a real tour de force um, around life on the island. And we have got time for uh, one or two questions which have come in through the chat this evening. So um, I will just pose those to you now. So um, finishing or starting off where uh, you finished off really, which is about trips to the island. We have tried to answer some of this within uh, the chat as, as you've been talking. But could you maybe say just a little bit more about longer trips? Can you stay over on the island? Uh, how, how do you uh, manage to do that? rather than just doing day trips. So that's, that's quite interesting, yeah. So you can, the Isle of May Bird Observatory have, uh, have the bird observatory on there, which you can book a slot between Saturday and Saturday. Um, so it's certainly worth checking out their website um, for availability. Um, now I do know it's this year, it's, 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 I believe it's actually closed until the 31st of July at the very least because of, of, of course, of COVID. Um, so that is playing havoc. Um, Really, after that, um, you know, the, the the places on the island are very uh, very limited because, of course, it's 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 all about research and, and obviously the staff who live on there. Um, you can actually volunteer on the island. Um, I'll be posting details very soon on the blog. Um, like an opportunity to, uh, to to give something back and actually stay on the island and help out. Um, so there's there's that opportunity as well. So yeah, it's 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 unfortunate. It's very restricted as how we've got it. Thank you for that, David. I should say that that question came from Cathy. So the next question is from Elvita. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, you outlined some of the uh, you know, downward trends in some species such as shag and kittiwake during your talk, but also that others are doing better, such as uh, razorbills and guillemots. And we just wondered whether you could maybe just tease out a little bit more as to why some are doing better than others. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's why are particular effects not not yeah, having the same effect on yeah it's, it's so so difficult each species has its own quirks and and and, and the issues it faces so for example shags at this very moment in time are struggling to feed because they they, they die for their food um but stay around the north sea in fact the, the population around the isle of may um and because of the turbulent seas if anyone lives near the coast you'll see just how rough it is um, and if you get continuous days of that, if you get a couple of weeks of that, um, they will really start to struggle and we will see birds being washed ashore dead um, because they'll just not be able to find food. And of course, the temperature is extremely low as well, which, which doesn't help. Um, so, so some birds, yeah, some birds are, are booking the trend. Some, some are doing quite well. And um, for example, a, a species which doesn't nest with us, but nests opposite on the largest gannet colony in the, in the world, uh, the bass rock gannets are doing extremely well. The, 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 the most, um, the fastest, increase in seabird um, and it's it's just where they can go to for their for their food really but for, for foraging areas they can go to um, and they're quite universal in what the, what the what they feed on um, we tend to find the surface feeders are, are struggling more of things like the kitty wakes um, and returns the um, they, are, they are struggling to find sand eels because they can't dive into the, the deeper water columns um, but it's 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 the, it's a million dollar question is, is why you know what what's going on and and that's what the scientists are trying to answer there's all these factors you know, from overfishing to climate change to, um, you know, the plankton moving north, sand eels um, being overfished. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult answer, to, to, to be honest, <laughs> if I'm being truthful. A complex picture out there. Um, yes, so, yeah. uh, we have a question from Janice, uh, and that is, uh, you mentioned that you'd encourage terns to return to the island and uh, just maybe, again, explore how you, how you went about doing that. It, I suppose it's quite simple, really. So we, we, we identified that we, we had the space and the capacity and, and the previously nested on there, which was key. Um, because we're predator free, we're, we don't have any ground predators. So that's why all these ground nesting birds can nest. Um, we identified an area which 
you know, it was just it was nettle and Yorkshire fog, the, the grass, um, so it didn't have great value. Um, and we decided just to literally lay um, tarpaulin down and then cover that with, with sand and, and gravel from the beach on the island. Um, and sure enough, the birds took to it. Um, it's, 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 it's known ways or known management techniques from other turn colonies um, up and down the British Isles, and we trialled it, and, and it worked successfully. Um, so we'll continue expanding that to, to hopefully help the, uh, the populations of those four turn species increase. Okay, great, thanks. And then finally, or just two questions really to close off, uh, one from Ruby, which is a question about the fact that the islands, you know, fairly close to the city of Edinburgh, issues around light pollution. Have you seen any effects from light pollution and do you actually monitor that? That's a very good question. Um, yeah, because we can see Edinburgh on a clear day. I can see the bridges and I can see Edinburgh. Um, and we obviously know the impacts because of obviously the Scottish Seabird Centre where you uh, scheme or you, you, you know, to, to give, have the members of the public report in puffin sightings, pufflins, which have gone, gone, gone inland. Um, there has been studies on, on some other nocturnal birds, things like Manx waters and the effects of light pollution. Um, so it is a real, it is a real hazard, um, especially for those nocturnal um, birds, which for us, it's puffins. Um, so yeah, it is a real threat, but no, we don't monitor it at this moment in time. We do get feedback obviously from yourself, Susan, at the Scottish Seabird Centre, telling us, you know, what's, what's going on with regards to how many birds have been picked up in, 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 in land. Um, but it would be a very difficult one I could have Imagine to uh, to do a great deal about to be honest with the conurbations which are up and down the fourth on either side. Maybe a bit more research in there for one of the universities yes. or uh, <laughs> uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, just before I finally wrap up for the evening, uh, Kathy asked uh, David, "What's your favourite bird?" <laughs> what a question oh my i've never been asked that question dear, dear me um right my favorite is it my favorite seabird or my favorite bird can it be well, both give us both give us both. give us both right my favorite my favorite bird um is, is a migrant which comes in from the continent called the great gray shrike and um, we do get them on the island here um and uh, they're known as butcher birds um, and they eat the mice on the island they're incredible little birds anyway um but my favorite seabird um it's a split um, i'm going to split it here um it's between the razor bill and the arctic tern um that's my two two favorite species really i'm sorry for you puffin fans out there it's not the puffin um <laughs> but i very much like those those two, two particular species Okay, thank you very much for that, David. <laughs> Bissell, thank you again for you know both giving us such an excellent presentation this evening, but also very ably answering uh, those questions for our guests this evening. It just leaves me to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, to say, Meet the Scientist is a program that we run throughout the year. Being able to do it online gives us uh, a broader reach to a wider um, audience than if we're just doing it at the centre. So even as we return post-COVID and we're able to open the centre again, we will be continuing with some online programmes. Um, so please do keep an eye on our website and do sign up to any other talks which uh, take your interest. But David, can I just, on behalf of the Seabird Centre team, and I, I think you know our guests this evening, can I thank you once again for such an excellent talk and for continuing to give of your time to the Scottish Seabird Centre. Thank you very much. Oh, it's a privilege. Thank you very much indeed, Susan. Thank you. Thank you.